And when the prisoners began to speak, they possessed an individual theory of prisons, the penal system, and justice. It is this form of discourse which ultimately matters, a discourse against power, the counter-discourse of prisoners and those we call delinquents and not a theory about delinquency. The problem of prisons is local and marginal, not more than 100,000 people pass through prisons in a year. In France at present, between 300,000 and 400,000 have been to prison. Yet this marginal problem seems to disturb everyone. I was surprised that so many who had not been to prison could become interested in its problems, surprised that all those who had never heard the discourse of inmates could so easily understand them. How do we explain this? Isn't it because, in a general way, the penal system is the form in which power is most obviously seen as power? To place someone in prison, to confine him to deprive him of food and heat, to prevent him from leaving, making love, etc. This is certainly the most frenzied manifestation of power imaginable. What is fascinating about prisons is that, for once, power doesn't hide or mask itself, it reveals itself as tyranny pursued into the tiniest details. Yes, and the reverse is equally true. Not only are prisoners treated like children, but children are treated like prisoners. Children are submitted to an infantilization which is alien to them. On this basis, it is undeniable that schools resemble prisons, and that factories are its closest approximation. Look at the entrance to a Renault plant, or anywhere else for that matter, three tickets to get into the washroom during the day. You found an 18th century text by Jeremy Bentham proposing prison reforms, in the name of this exalted reform. B establishes a circular system, where the renovated prison serves as a model, and where the individual passes imperceptibly from school to the factory, from the factory to prison and vice versa. This is the essence of the reforming impulse, of reformed representation. On the contrary, when people begin to speak, and act on their own behalf, they do not oppose their representation to another, they do not oppose a new representativity to the false representativity of power. For example, I remember your saying, that there is no popular justice against justice, the reckoning takes place at another level. I think that it is not simply the idea of better and more equitable forms of justice that underlies the people's hatred of the judicial system, of judges, courts, and prisons, but aside from this, and before anything else the singular perception, that power is always exercised at the expense of the people. The anti-judicial struggle is a struggle against power and I don't think that it is a struggle against injustice, against the injustice of the judicial system, or a struggle for improving the efficiency of its institutions. My hypothesis but it is merely an hypothesis is that popular courts, such as those found in the revolution, were a means for the lower middle class, who were allied with the masses, to salvage and recapture the initiative in the struggle against the judicial system. To achieve this, they proposed a court system, based on the possibility of equitable justice, where a judge might render a just verdict. The identifiable form of the court of law belongs to the bourgeois ideology of justice. On the basis of our actual situation, power emphatically develops a total or global vision. That is, all the current forms of repression. The racist repression of immigrant workers, repression in the factories, in the educational system, and the general repression of youth, are easily totalized from the point of view of power. We should not only seek the unity of these forms in the reaction to May 68, but more appropriately, in the concerted preparation and organization of the near future French capitalism now relies on a margin of unemployment, and has abandoned the liberal and paternal mask that promised full employment. In this perspective, we begin to see the unity of the forms of repression, restrictions on immigration, once it is acknowledged that the most difficult and thankless jobs go to immigrant workers' repression in the factories, because the French must reacquire the taste for increasingly harder work, the struggle against youth and the repression of the educational system, because police repression is more active when there is less need for young people in the workforce. A wide range of professionals, teachers, psychiatrists, educators of all kinds, will be called upon to exercise functions that have traditionally belonged to the police. This is something you predicted long ago, and it was thought impossible at the time, the reinforcement of all the structures of confinement, 
Against this global policy of power, we initiate localized counter-responses, skirmishes, active and occasionally preventive defenses. We have no need to totalize that which is invariably totalized on the side of power. If we were to move in this direction, it would mean restoring the representative forms of centralism and a hierarchical structure. We must set up lateral affiliations and an entire system of networks and popular bases, and this is especially difficult. In any case, we no longer define reality as a continuation of politics in the traditional sense of competition and the distribution of power, through the so-called representative agencies of the Communist Party or the General Workers' Union. Reality is what actually happens in factories, in schools, in barracks, in prisons, in police stations. And this action carries a type of information, which is altogether different from that found in newspapers. Isn't this difficulty of finding adequate forms of struggle a result of the fact that we continue to ignore the problem of power? After all, we had to wait until the 19th century before we began to understand the nature of exploitation, and to this day, we have yet to fully comprehend the nature of power. It may be that Marx and Freud cannot satisfy our desire for understanding this enigmatic thing which we call power, which is at once visible and invisible, present and hidden, ubiquitous. Theories of government and the traditional analyses of their mechanism certainly don't exhaust the field where power is exercised and where it functions. The question of power remains a total enigma. Who exercises power? And in what sphere? We now know with reasonable certainty who exploits others, who receives the profits, which people are involved, and we know how these funds are reinvested. But as for power, we know that it is not in the hands of those who govern. But, of course, the idea of the ruling class has never received an adequate formulation, and neither have other terms, such as to dominate, to rule, to govern, etc. These notions are far too fluid and require analysis. We should also investigate the limits imposed on the exercise of power the relays through which it operates, and the extent of its influence on the often insignificant aspects of the hierarchy and the forms of control, surveillance, prohibition, and constraint. Everywhere that power exists, it is being exercised. No one, strictly speaking, has an official right to power, and yet it is always excited in a particular direction, with some people on one side and some on the other. It is often difficult to say who holds power in a precise sense, but it is easy to see who lacks power. If the reading of your books, from Nietzsche to what I anticipate in capitalism and schizophrenia has been essential for me, it is because they seem to go very far in exploring this problem, under the ancient theme of meaning, of the signifier and the signified, you have developed the question of power, of the inequality of powers and their struggles. Each struggle develops around a particular source of power any of the countless, tiny sources a small time boss, the manager of HLM the discourse of struggle is not opposed to the unconscious, but to the secretive. It may not seem like much, but what if it turned out to be more than we expected? A whole series of misunderstandings relates to things that are bitten, repressed, and unsaid, and they permit the cheap psychoanalysis of the proper objects of struggle. It is perhaps more difficult to unearth the secret than the unconscious. The two themes frequently encountered in the recent past, that writing gives rise to repressed elements and that writing is necessarily a subversive activity, seem to betray a number of operations that deserve to be severely denounced. With respect to the problem you posed, it is clear who exploits, who profits, and who governs, but power nevertheless remains something more diffuse. I would venture the following hypothesis, the thrust of Marxism, was to define the problem essentially in terms of interests, power is held by a ruling class defined by its interests. The question immediately arises, how is it that people whose interests are not being served, can strictly support the existing power structure, by demanding a piece of the action? Perhaps, this is because in terms of investments, whether economic or unconscious, interest is not the final answer, there are investments of desire that function in a more profound, and if use manner than our interests dictate. But of course, we never desire against our interests, because interest always follows, and finds itself where desire has placed it. We cannot shut out the scream of Reich, the masses were not deceived, at a particular time, they actually wanted a fascist regime, 
There are investments of desire, that mold and distribute power, that make it the property of the policeman as much as of the prime minister. In this context, there is no qualitative difference between the power wielded by the policeman and the prime minister. The nature of these investments of desire in a social group explains why political parties or unions, which might have or should have revolutionary investments in the name of class interests, are so often reform-oriented or absolutely reactionary on the level of desire. As you say, the relationship between desire, power, and interest are more complex than we ordinarily think, and it is not necessarily those who exercise power who have an interest in its execution, nor is it always possible for those with vested interests to exercise power. Moreover, the desire for power establishes a singular relationship between power and interest. It may happen that the masses, during fascist periods, desire that certain people assume power, people with whom they are unable to identify, since these individuals exert power against the masses, and at their expense, to the extreme of their death, their sacrifice, their massacre. Nevertheless, they desire this particular power, they want it to be exercised. This play of desire, power, and interest has received very little attention. It was a long time before we began to understand exploitation and desire has had and continues to have a long history. It is possible that the struggles now taking place and the local, regional and discontinuous theories that derive from these struggles and that are indissociable from them stand at the threshold of our discovery of the manner in which power is exercised. In this context, I must return to the question. The present revolutionary movement has created multiple centers, and not as the result of weakness or insufficiency, since a certain kind of totalization pertains to power and the forces of reaction. Vietnam, for instance, is an impressive example of localized counter tactics. But bo are we to define the networks, the transversal links between these active and discontinuous points? from one country to another, or within a single country? The question of geographical discontinuity which you raise, might mean the following, as soon as we struggle against exploitation, the proletariat not only leads the struggle, but also defines its targets, its methods, and the places and instruments for confrontation, and to ally oneself with the proletariat, is to accept its positions, its ideology, and its motives for combat. This means total identification. But if the fight is directed against power, then all those on whom power is exercised to their detriment, all who find it intolerable, can begin the struggle on their own terrain, and on the basis of their proper activity, or passivity. In engaging in a struggle that concerns their own interests, whose objectives they clearly understand, and whose methods only they can determine, they enter into a revolutionary process. They naturally enter as allies of the proletariat, because power is exercised the way it is in order to maintain capitalist exploitation. They genuinely serve the cause of the proletariat, by fighting in those places they find themselves oppressed. Women, prisoners, conscripted soldiers, hospital patients, and homosexuals have now begun a specific struggle against the particularities power, the constraints and controls, that are exerted over them. Such struggles are actually involved in the revolutionary movement to the degree that they are radical, uncompromising and non-reformist, and refuse any attempt at arriving at a new disposition of the same power with, at best, a change of masters. And these movements are linked to the revolutionary movement of the proletariat to the extent that they fight against the controls and constraints which serve the same system of power. In this sense, the overall picture presented by the struggle is certainly not that of the totalization you mentioned earlier, this theoretical totalization under the guise of truth. The generality of the struggle specifically derives from the system of power itself, from all the forms in which power is exercised and applied, and which we are unable to approach in any of its applications without revealing its diffuse character, so that we are necessarily led on the basis of the most insignificant demand to the desire, to blow it up completely. Every revolutionary attack or defense, however partial, is linked in this way to the worker struggle.